listen. Listening. I'm listening. I'm being listened. You cannot see me as I'm listening, as I'm not watching at you. You. I'm listening to you. I think listen is the most intimate sense that we have as human beings. Quite overwhelming, because you let the other person really into you. It's so present, hearing the voice again and again, the sentence again and again. He is so much more than the person who spoke was aware of. So generous listening kind of means you hear more than the person speaking. You know more, every little like hesitation. Like if you would listen to what I'm saying now in a generous way, it's, um, it can be shocking. In terms of listening, the experience of, of being immersed in a situation where you have to activate all your senses. Silence is often part of that experience. I would say it changed very much my understanding of what it means to try and conduct, say, an exploration, how to move out from, say, the written page or other forms which were possibly more familiar before I started this inquiry. I believe that the act of listening to and in the ocean is fundamentally important. The ocean teaches us also about the limitation of our sensory system that we rely on, right? Uh, a lot of our being is geared at looking and seeing as the primary sense. It's also an act of connecting, right? So many species in the ocean uh, rely on sound, on location, on echolocation, to hunt, to find food, but also to find mates, to orient themselves and to communicate. Listening, I think, is something that happens with the entire body all the time. And for me, is a kind of primary mode of artistic response and responsibility. Um, by listening to a space or to a place or to a person, one can sort of better understand how can I be in conversation with something. I suppose I see it as the listening is the, the primary artistic activity. First and foremost, uh, listening. And through that listening begins uh, the formation of a bond, of a relation uh, from which a response can grow. That's something that's in conversations, making yourself, making your entire being um, available for response. Um, it's something that uh, yeah, the world requires of us at this moment to, to listen and to listen carefully and deeply and fully um, and find within us uh, that capacity to respond. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Generous Listening Symposium at Teatro Piccolo Arsenale, uh, organized within the scope of the Meetings on Architecture Public Program at the La Biennale de Venezia, in collaboration with Vuslat Foundation. Our symposium will begin with the founder of Vuslat Foundation, Vuslat Doan Sabanja, followed by the curator of this year's Biennale, Hashim Sarkis, and then leading artist Giuseppe Penone with Chus Martinez, after which we'll watch a performance by Inge Evinar. In the following section, we'll be hosting a debate between Chus Martinez, director Kenan McKenzie, and architect Francesco Bergamo, followed by a panel by Hashim Sarkis and Professor Caroline Jones. And finally, we'll invite all the speakers back for a Q&A session. 
So to begin with, I'd like to invite the founder of Vuslat Foundation, Vuslat Doğan Sabancı, to the stage. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great day. It's a delight to welcome you all to Generous Listening Symposium in collaboration with Venice Biennale of Architecture. Speaking of generous listening, I would like to start by posing a question to you. Do you ever, how often, when you're speaking, you feel interrupted or pushed to finish your sentence? or if I reverse the tables, how often do you find yourself, catch yourself, trying to say what you want to say in a place where you ought to be listen, listening? I'm sure many of you relate to this because we are all tempted to interrupt because we care more about what we say and how we say than what we hear when we listen. Um, but consider why we have two ears and only one mouth. Well, I can go in the whys and speculate for hours, but for the purpose of this meeting, I will focus on one function of listening, which is crucial, and that is creating connections. When we listen, we create connections, and we don't just create any connections. When we listen generously, which means engaging our hearts as well as our minds, then we create meaningful, joyous connections. Research says that people you know, are never happier because they have a bigger house, because they have a better car, or so forth. What makes people happy is family, friends, and the healthy, good connections, meaningful connections that they build. But today, we live in an era where speaking, all forms of, of speaking, is super glorified, whereas the power of listening is very much totally dismissed. Uh, it's all about how many contacts we have, the social interactions we have, and so forth. But what a paradox. Even in, in the abundance of this much interaction, we feel lonely. Loneliness is one of the biggest um, problems, diseases of today. Um, even mental health deteriorating every year, every single year, it has reached some alarming levels, especially for youth. And imagine, if we would connect to ourselves better, listen to ourselves better, to each other and to nature, do you think we would be feeling lonely? I'm sure we would not. And this is just on the individual level. What about in the societal level? In the societal level, the broken connections or the lack of quality of connections brings us to social exclusion, fear of the unknown, um, prejudice, even violence. And um, on the, I would, argue that the biggest damage of our connections goes to lack of connections, goes to nature. After the, um, I mean, after the modernity, we started seeing each other superior to nature and separated from nature, which brought us to the current state of uh, environmental crisis. Uh, as a former publisher of Turkey's leading daily newspaper, I, I dedicated a big portion of myself to facilitating conversations, with, especially with diverse communities. However, with the rise of social media, the role of media, as well as what we call success for media, totally changed. It became all about reach, how many people we reach, how many viewers, how many uh, readers, and so forth. And this kind of overshadowed the importance of having good conversations with diverse viewpoints, with diverse uh, people. Everyone started seeing them as a standalone media and acted so. Twitter became a channel of angry crowds. Instagram, super polished content. And everyone wanted to be more sensational, 
provocative, even divisive, to be heard more, to get more attention. I realized my idealism of media came to a dead end. I needed to zoom out and to clarify how I could serve the world better to engendering good conversations. I decided to take a year off, and it was in the midst of turmoil. And I intuitively embarked to a series of listening journeys. I wanted to get out of my comfort zone and listen to people that I thought were far away from my circle. And I went with no title and absolutely no agenda. I listened to women with conservatively religious backgrounds, lifestyles, but I also went to brothel owners in Anatolia and listened to them. I went to women who've seen, who've been, um, who've seen violence in women's shelters, but I also went to prisons and listened to murderers who've shown, who've committed uh, homicide. In each of my listening experiences, I became, I, I said I take a further step in becoming a better listener. By now, I know that listening is a muscle. And just like any muscle, you tone it by practice. And uh, this is very important, but I gathered some more information about listening. And that is you need to prepare yourself to listening. And that comes with a clear intention. Uh, saying to yourself, committing to yourself, I am going to put everything about my ego, my mind, so forth on the side, and I will have the intention to listen to, uh, to this person or to yourself, makes really a big, big uh, magic. But there are also some uh, important practical steps you can do. One is, of course, do not interrupt. And another one is, which I'm having a lot of um, difficulties with, is do not try to s uh, offer any solutions or fix any problems. Just listen. And then most of the time, maybe you realize your mind starts wondering. If you realize that, bring it back, because we all have that. Well, some of my listening experiences lasted just for a few, few minutes. Those were not successful on my side. Some lasted, though, for hours. Some of them were very informative, but with some of them, I went so deep that I started working and even uh, inner work. In the end of each listening experience, my perspective changed, it shook my beliefs, and motivated me to open a bigger space for myself to listen to myself. Now, I want to share with you one of those transformative listening experiences I had. It was a visit to a woman's shelter in a low-income uh, city, uh, Izmir, in Turkey. For 15 years, I had been working relentlessly against domestic violence. We had designed a nationwide, uh, nationwide um, awareness building uh, campaign, and we had lobbied to protect the woman uh, who was seeing violence for legislation. We started the first and only hotline, and so forth. In all, during all those works, many times I visited shelters, women's shelters. I talked to the survivors of abuse. But none of these encounters affect me so deeply as it did with Zeynep. Let me tell you a little bit about Zeynep. Zeynep, first of all, her real name is not Zeynep, but I will call her Zeynep because she is still under life threat. She had a very challenging life, a di difficult life. She was abandoned as a child, and now she's in a woman's shelter. Her difficult experiences at the shelter were very similar to the other stories I had heard, but this time there was something different. I was listening in a different presence, with a different presence. I had spent the entire day listening to difficult stories, and 
I had promised to go to the shelter, so I said, I will, I will have to go. But I had absolutely no uh, physical or emotional strength to give to her. As I was listening to her, I was just listening to her. No solutions, no agenda, no strength. And then an unusual thing happened. Zeynep, this petite, meek-looking woman, morphed into a giant as she talked. And me, I shrank into my whisper of myself. As she talked, the power dynamic between the two of us completely inverted. And um, uh, it seemed as if I was not there to, to help her, to give her power, but I was there to, to get some of her courage for resilience. Her words transported me far beyond her story to the depths of my own story. And through our stories, even though we come from completely different lives, I realized how much common emotions and um, common emotions, feelings we shared, especially as mothers, our love and our uh, concern for our children. We have a beautiful saying in Turkish. I'm sure many of you who are Turkish know this very well, and that's listening with your heart, Seer. It is, if you engage your heart, you go beyond the words. And for the first time, with, the Zay with listening to Zeynep, I fully comprehended the, the meaning of the phrase. And I said, I ought to uh, define this, shape this, and globalize this. This is the background birth story of generous listening. Generous listening has the power to restore connections, broken connections, and they, it shows us that we're all one and the same, uh, unique but one. It's impossible to become a generous listener, listener without doing the work personally. So most of the time when we talk about listening, it's listening to the other, that's the perception. But I truly believe and convinced from my experiences that you've got to do the work personally. And nature, <laughs> does this, is this a sign? <laughs> I spoke too long. <laughs> so nature is also a, a very important part of it because I found integrating these stories and making meaning of what I lived in nature. I learned to silence my mind and open myself to the unknown in nature. Strengthening the quality, uh, the, quanti the quality of our connections is an antidote to world's many problems, from uh, mental health to uh, other rising to exploitation of nature to prejudice and so forth. Generous listening is an essential and a powerful tool to deepen our connections. If we agree all the, on this, then we need to talk on how. How do we do it? How do we cultivate a, 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 a culture of generous listening? Well, one of the most important steps is to, is to bring awareness on it, is to build up awareness on it. And this is exactly what we're doing all together. And everyone that's watching us, listening to us virtually, we are elevating the role of listening in, in the world. So thank you for being part of this. And I feel very, very fortunate to start this journey with Giuseppe Penone, who has been writing and working on becoming nature since the late 60s. His works and ideas are great inspiration to all of us. Thank you, Giuseppe, for, uh, for your vision and for also sharing your work to be a symbol on, on our journey. Thank you. <laughs> the second step is cultivating the culture of Janus listening is to creating listening spaces. Architects and designers since a long time have done great, great work on creating stages for speaking. Now, as Hashim Sarkis puts it, it's time to ask the question of how do we create spaces for listening? 
and I'm very curious, looking forward to listen to Francesco Bergamo's views on this. The third important step in cultivating the uh, culture of generous listening is, of course, integrating it in the system so it's here to stay, so it's long-lasting. The most important system in the world is the education system. So we have collaborated with uh, Tufts University in, in Boston on creating a generous listening and dialogue center and the director of the center is here with us today, uh, Kenan McKinsey. So I'm really looking forward on that discussion as well. Well, uh, I hope I have convinced you on the importance of generous listening. Now I want to make my final point on the urgency of generous listening. Dear guests, as you might know, United Nations declared sustainable development goals, 17 sustainable development goals. S uh, since then, these range from uh, environment crisis to gender equality to income inequality, education. Since six years that, has, that it has been declared, it shows no, unfortunately, hope that it will be reached. So why is it that so many uh, businesses, philanthropies, so many organizations, NGOs are working, are, have put their efforts in these 17 SDGs, but we are not able to take much step further. I'll take an informed leap of faith and say that it's not done because it's not done in a culture of generous listening. It's not co-creation, it's not collaboration, it comes with their own ideas to impose, and we cannot move forward. We have to accept this, we have to uh, in internalize this, that in every effort that we will do in this world today, it's intertwined. And without that collective uh, thinking, which is super important li for listening, we will not be able to find any results soon. So these are, of course, super big, audacious goals. But we can st start with a very simple step, very immediate, simple step. And we can all make an intention to start listen generously, at least uh, our intimate ones, or maybe some further away ones. So I welcome you all for being in this journey with us and, and sharing this notion of elevating listening in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'd like to welcome the curator of the Architecture Biennale, Hashim Sarkis, on Zoom. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah? I go? Okay. Uh, I feel very privileged to be working on this Biennale not just in partnership and with the generous support of the Fuslat Foundation in making this Biennale happen at a time when nobody was listening, when nobody believed that this effort could materialize given the crisis we were living in under the pandemic. It took faith, it took a deep of faith for anyone to understand that this Biennale is going to be possible and that it would be possible in different circumstances. It would be a different in our labor. It would be an important one. The Wuslat Foundation listened and believed and helped us make it happen. So thank you, Wuslat, and thank you, Wuslat Foundation, primarily for everything you've done. But this Binali would also not have happened had I, at least happened in this form, had I not been privileged to be part of the discussions that led to the formation of the foundation at its inception. 
from early days in 2018 in Istanbul and 2019 in London, and many dialogues over Zoom that I had to articulate much more clearly, and uh, I would say generously, the uh, theme of the Biennale. The question, how will we live together, obviously has many dimensions that require thinking about how do we form collectivities, how do we form cooperation. And these do involve different instruments, including listening. But formed as I am as an architect and architecture as a field uh, does always focus on spaces of gathering, but the gathering is primarily about the eye, primarily about the voice, and never or rarely about the ear. In architecture schools, we teach first how to formalize spaces in terms of their visual qualities, connectivities through the eye, how people see each other, how they approach a space, what they see, their orientation and their organization of spaces is primarily based on the eye and the experience of the body, but led by the eye. The voice comes second, and we do teach acoustics, we do teach uh, materials in terms of how they re respond to sound and voice. But we don't focus enough on how space entices people to slow down, to be attentive to each other, to be respectful of each other. It's, for me right now, at least in my thinking, very difficult to understand how these qualities of generous listening that the Puslat Foundation is working on and that Puslat just expanded on earlier very beautifully uh, translate into space. We have ways to go in this direction, but I again here want to thank the Puslat Foundation for putting these challenges in front of us as humanity in general, but also as architects. Over the different visits and brainstorming sessions, retreats with the Muslat Foundation. These notions of generosity and listening uh, somehow fermented in my thinking as I was curating the exhibition. And if there's anything I would like to share with you today in the space allotted to me, uh, is how these questions really became fundamental to the thinking about the United. As you may know, the Biennale is organized around five scales. How will we live together among diverse beings? Meaning, it is time for us to open up the space of architecture and the space of the world to not just other human beings, but other beings as well. To think of our own selves as being fluid in our identity, in our gender, in our ethnicities, but also to think of our connectedness with other species. For us to be able to live, we need to live together with other species. Otherwise, we are compromising our own existence as well, let alone that of others, which we have been doing forever. So we need to rethink completely the space around which our bodies exist and interact with others. As I've been working with the Bustad Foundation and uh, seeing how their program and ideas evolved, I began to realize that perhaps one way to think about these spaces in terms of interaction with others, uh, maybe opening a space for the voice, maybe the space for the ear. But ultimately, these will translate if we listen correctly, if we interact correctly, into emotive spaces of sorts spaces that evoke certain emotions and through this kind of emotive synthesis we are able to open up architecture to these new possibilities. In terms of the space of the body and living among diverse beings, felt that uh, the emotive space of empathy becomes extremely important to emphasize. And opening up the possibility of how space allows us to empathize, how space allows us to see, listen, and be attentive to others' needs and concerns. So 
as we go from the space of the body to the space of the household and opening up the space of the household to other possibilities of houses being not just about the nuclear family, but other forms of organization of a familial space to the space of community and emerging communities and trying to figure out how people's dignity and identity can be formed and reformed through affiliation with other communities to working across borders so that the dominant identity of the nation state is complemented, is challenged, supplemented with other in relationship to other identities. And then finally, to the scale of the planet, how do we live together as one planet, as one humanity? Uh, each of these requires a very different form of affiliation, a different emotive space, I would say, to connect. So, over one of the conferences, I think it was the one in London with the Husla Foundation, the five scales for me became five emotive spaces. The space of the body becomes the space of empathy. The space of the household became the space of love. The space of the community became the space of affinity. The space of working across nations became the space of curiosity, projecting, reaching out to create a level of curiosity, but also respect. And the space of the planet became the space of humanity and universality. It is through these five emotive spaces that I thought through the organization of the Dinali and helped me a lot in bringing the different kinds of projects together to go from an understanding of space in its materiality, its visuality, its uh, dimensionality to space as a possible instrument of evocation and encouragement of certain emotive relationships for all of the above and for hopefully the way that the work manifests itself as a form of building cooperation and collaboration among people. I want to thank the Islam Foundation for helping us really articulate this dimension added to architecture. Much work lies ahead in this space but you have opened up a lot of possibilities for architecture in this domain. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite to the stage now the leading artist, sculptor, and our keynote speaker, Giuseppe Penone with historian, writer, and curator at large at Puslat Foundation, Chus Martinez. So, where to start? Um, at the end of the day, when we talk about listening, we are not talking about something so different from uh, perceiving or being in front or in the presence of, uh, of an artwork. Actually, the, the history of, um, of the relationship that we establish with artworks is the history of reception. It's really not the history of broadcast. So it's really not very difficult to, to relate listening to the presence, of being in the presence of, of artists and being in the presence of artworks. But actually, it's very interesting how in the last decades we have been insisting that this presence was not enough. Um, that actually um, being receiving and, and being in this um, companionship with artworks was insufficient. And um, we started a divide that has been accompanying us for, for many years, which is the divide in between the praxis and the theory, and it's also the divide in between uh, the producers and the receivers. So instead of talking about uh, being in the presence, we start talking about the production of knowledge. So even knowledge that uh, is something immaterial has been described 
as having the logic of, um, of a common good that could be made, that we were doers of knowledge. And it took us many years, actually, and many efforts, mostly done by artists mm, before, but we have a very um, skim memory in the art world, but also younger generations to reclaim and to actually reprogram that language and talking about receiving and letting beside the production of knowledge, which is a singular, both words in singular, and moving into the plurals of the productions of knowledges by and then dropping production and just talking about knowledges, even indigenous knowledges, acknowledging the plurality, the diversity that exists in the models of perceiving. And it took many, many years and many decades, and it's a, a great pleasure for me to be in the company of uh, Giuseppe Pinone, because I think it has been uh, his work, a, a major um, keen stone, milestone, as they say in English, to, to actually make that turn. And that turn is a turn that it has been um, obvious um, inside a certain texture of the art world, but not to everyone. And I must say, and I was telling him that I've been experiencing an incredible interest and a new actuality of works like yours among younger generations. And I would start just by asking you about, about the trees and the trees in your work and the you know, the non-symbolic relationship that you have with nature, but the one-to-one -one relationship that you establish in your practice as a sculpture with nature. Uh, I, I started my work in the uh, end of 60, and it was a moment uh, uh, where the uh, young artist was working uh, against the convention of the art that was uh, uh, before, so the the relation with the uh, with the material and uh, with the uh, with the form was uh, uh, a relation that uh, want to be related to the reality. This was the basic uh, uh, um, idea. It was uh, and the reality was a word that. Uh, was very important at, at that time. For me, I was very young. I was uh, I 68, I was 21. Um, my idea, uh, in intuition, was to work with something that I know better than other things. And it was the, the world uh, that surrounded me in my uh, um, Adolescence in my f first yeah. year of, <laughs> and uh, uh, the interest that I had was about the sculpture, and the be the most simple things that you can do to make a sculpture is to touch something. When you touch, in the moment that you touch, you are equal. Your body and the things that you touch have, is, is the same. So with this idea, it was possible for me to do a work with clay, with marble, with uh, any material, but always based on the idea of, of equity and of touch. And I tried to make uh, visible this idea uh, with uh, uh, um, a work uh, related to the growth of the tree. I think that the tree, it was... Uh, uh, a fantastic sculpture in himself because he memorized in his body all his life and is a fantastic uh, sculpture because he uh, has the necessity of his life. So it was, uh, uh, for me, it was uh, an example of sculpture perfect and I associated to this example of sculpture uh, my gesture that was just to touch the tree. So I made a, an end in uh, iron, and I put on, on, on the trunk of the tree, and the tree in the time he grew, and he make himself the, the, the print of my hand in, the, in his body, like the print of my hand in the clay. So it was this the bas basic idea. It was an idea of equity between the, the, the element, the material, 
that we touch and, and the man that touched the material. Um, when I was a student, I had a, a professor of contemporary art and um, he told us that uh, in the classroom, and you said the word reality, we should talk about uh, you know, the pragmatics of, of reality and those pragmatics should be only read through the conditions that affect the human, specifically labor. So uh, good artwork, if you were a young Spaniard, it's an artwork that would be uh, addressing in a direct way the conditions of the human under the lens of labor, how labor creates an exploitation, and that everything related to nature would be a distraction, and that nobody could consider nature a political substance. And I still remember that because for many years, I was thinking that every time that I fall in love with something relating to nature, I was committing a sin. I was not being politically engaged or I should not derivate or try to escape the real conditions uh, that real humans were facing uh, by going somewhere else. And many decades later, I discovered that there is no such dichotomy, that actually um, this binary is a binary uh, which is a, a, a false one, but um, in, in the ideology of many of the, of the teachings about the function, uh, the good function, the good example of artists and art in our society, this has been excluded. And I'm asking you how politically is your approach to nature and how do you see it as well? Because you have been the maker of that substance. You made it possible for many of us to unite these two dimensions. Um, the, the, the fact that to work with some, uh, with an element that was not used uh, in that time in, uh, in art, uh, it was already a choose that was also a political choose in, in a way because you work with something that uh, is, no, is neglected in, in this moment. So this was uh, uh, something that uh, uh, I have done, not, I was pro probably I was not conscient of, of this, but uh, I have done and uh, I, I feel completely in, in <laughs> and, uh, and I follow this idea for all, all my life. So it was uh, something that was very deeply in my, in my understanding of the reality. And this, uh, uh, the reality in a way, the, and the, it became, if you consider the reality, the things that surrounded you in, uh, uh, and you try to, to be connected with them, this is a, a politic uh, uh, action. And uh, my work is, uh, and understood, I try to understand the reality that surrounded me through the language of sculpture. But um, you also have experienced how the conditions of the reception of this work has changed a lot, I think. Uh, we see now everyone talking about multi-species communication. So when you say to us that when you touch something, you are equal with the, with the thing you touch, uh, we understand it, let's say, in a much more um, deep dimension than perhaps uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago, where the talk of interspecies was definitely not there. It's true that uh, it was very different, uh, the perception of the, function of the reality of the man and the perception of the other uh, elements of the nature. But uh, uh, as I... I insist about this, My, I have done a work of sculpture. When you do a work of sculpture, you have to work with a material. If you don't respect the material, if you don't understand the material, you cannot do a good sculpture. So it was basic for me, this, uh, uh, this idea. And, and, and the, in that case, you have a kind of equity uh, between the man and the material. And all the work that I have done, I try to do, uh, to follow the material in himself and to give the image that is inside of the material. So it's not uh, an action that uh, try to shape the material with an idea. It's an action that try to reveal 
the, the image of the material. Yeah, and uh, in your work also there is a dimension that I consider incredibly important relating to that because as you said, you are not trying to superimpose a form in the material, but to figure out, to reveal, to talk, to have a conversation or even a relationship, a very deep relationship with this material till a form appears or reveals. Um, but, and there is nothing, let's say, mystical or even very metaphorical about it. It's a, it's a true process. It does happen. No? So it's like, you know, it can be read as a poetical act, but it also can be seen as something that, that happens indeed. No? But it is also a, a um, you have to, um, if I consider the, the, the time, I, I think always about 60, 70, there was uh, an art that was not uh, uh, based on figure. The most uh, interesting art was uh, about abstraction and uh, concept. Uh, with nature, you can introduce the figure in, in, in the art. So if uh, if I I made a, a tree, we it, I reveal the tree that is inside of a piece of wood. Uh, this is an image. Is an image. Uh, no, is not just. Uh, a, a, is an action and is an image. Uh, is is a real image. A, an image of the reality that is inside of the uh, of the material. And. I know that you have been also very interested in the relationship that there is in between voluntary acts and involuntary acts. So, um, in other words, in your work there is as much an interest for form as there is an interest for breathing. In form, traditionally speaking, in arts, is something that the artists create, perhaps together with nature, but you create it, and it's something that is uh, voluntary. It's we may want to create or to reach a form. But in breathing, we do it without thinking about it. And there is something involuntary. And this is a, a level of uh, reflection that is, is not very present in contemporary discourse. But I, um, you know, if I send you back to Aristotle, already there, there is an incredible reflection on the importance of knowing the difference of these two worlds and relating them and putting them together. Um, and perhaps you can talk a little bit about this question of breathing or these involuntary uh, moments that cannot be seen by the mind. They but don't pass the mind. No, yeah, uh, it was another aspect of my work. It, it was always based on the idea, on the thinking of to touch something. When you touch something, you give an image. Uh, the, the image is the print of your hand, of your body. This is uh, an image that is not interesting. It's an image that is uh, animals. It's uh, is an imprint of, of a body that it can be uh, done by, by everybody. But it became uh, interesting if you uh, try to, to understand what is this uh, image and if you reveal to the people, to the other people, the image. So it became an example of, of, of image that and became, it can became something that uh, he, he have a relation uh, with, with the image of, of art too. So it's uh, um, the understood of uh, something that is, uh, uh, usual, that is not, uh, uh, not voluntary, that is just uh, something that happened, like a f reality happened around, uh, around us. And to reveal this, uh, it was something that was similar for me to the work that I have done with the growing of the tree. And also the choice of the materials. I think the trees that we sometimes see by you, they are actually trees that are trees made of wood, but they are not, the wood is not present in themselves sometimes. They are transferred into bronze. So how do you make that decision? How did it came in your work at all to make that decision of making that transfer? To make, to use... Uh, to use bronze to, to yeah, to, to produce the trees. Some of them, bronze. I think. Yeah. 
No, uh, this was because uh, um, I, <laughs> it was a long history in a way. I have done a work that was about potatoes. Potatoes, well, uh, and I ma made, uh, I put potatoes on the, in the ground. Uh, when, um, when they start to grow, I put it close to the potato, the little potatoes, the, the mold of, uh, of a face. And the potatoes uh, had the, the shape of the, of the face. So this was a work that I have done in 77. And uh, to, to preserve this uh, work, I have done bronze. When I, I casted uh, it in bronze, I realized that uh, there was a big, uh, very strong connection between the vegetal and the technique of the, of the foundry. Because the, for, in order to have a, 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 a bronze piece, uh, they, they have to do a kind of, uh, of uh, branches that uh, will be the, uh, to um, alimentate the, 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 the sculpture uh, uh, with the material. So it was like uh, the structure of a tree but reversed. The tree was attracted by the light and the bronze uh, casting was done with the uh, gravity force. Well, it was the reverse of the of the of the group. So I I think it in uh, uh, Gaudi that when he have done the Sagrada Familia, he produced a model in his studio with uh, where he reversed the curve of the architecture. Uh, so it is uh, is the reverse exactly the reverse of the of the group uh, is the is the gravity force. So uh, the, this uh, uh, gave me the idea to produce uh, bronze uh, uh, tree because the tree is, uh, uh, the, the weight of the tree is supported by the, the, the life of the light and, uh, and is against the idea of the gravity of the depth. So this uh, contrast between the grow and the, and the and the gravity force is also the reason of the stone that is uh, mm -hmm. on the piece that we have in, in the Arsenale. And also in the piece that you did for the, for the um, Documenta, in Documenta 13, yeah, in the, the park. The and the I still thing. remember when the tree arrived and it was the first piece of the Documenta, so it inaugurated the Documenta. And it was uh, located in the Our Park in Kassel. And um, I, you know, observe from the window of the office how people uh, started going to the tree thinking it was a real tree, but wondering if a real tree would have a stone on top. And then they came because of the stone, so the stone was like a lighthouse. It was attracting people curious because of the stone, thinking that it was just a normal tree, but some miracle happened and it was sustaining a stone. And then the very moment that they put the hand on the tree, noticing that the tree was warm, because in, in a warm day it would kept, and even in not a warm day, it kept the temperature of the climate. And then in the, reali in the realization of the temperature of the object, the faces of the people change. And I still remember people like being with one hand on the phone and with the other hand attached to the tree. Just this idea of communicating twice, like calling somebody but touching the tree. So. <laughs> yes, but the piece that we have here installed in, in the Laguna, I, I, for me, it have a, also a meaning uh, and a relation very, di very deep with the town, because the town is uh, founded on on tree, on branches that is under the, the building, so they support the stone. So it is something that have uh, like uh, it was fantastic opportunity to can show this piece in the Laguna. For that reason, for me, it was really. Uh, a, a, a fantastic possibility, and I have to thank uh, the foundation of Uslat that gave me the, this opportunity. And also you said to us that there is a, a history of a disaster behind that uh, tree in the, in the um, Laguna, no? because it's not common, or I, I would say it's the only tree I've seen of yours uh, in the water, and in the salt water, and there is the reason of that disaster that happened in 
2018 in the Veneto, if I don't remember it wrongly, no, that destroyed 14 million trees. Yes. So it's uh, it's also a relationship with yes. that. And um, I want to end by being polemic. Um, so you know, now when you look at the landscape of the art world, there is almost um, no day that you don't see an exhibition with the word nature on it. And everyone is, in a positive way of course, um, claiming that relationship, claiming that possibility, and also finding out spaces in the social and in, in culture uh, to relate the common citizenship with the question of climate justice, but also with the possibility of an entanglement with nature in general. But, but how do you feel and how did your work change, if it changed at all? Because this is a, is a complete different situation than, than some decades ago. I think it, it was not like that at all. But, uh, my work, I think it don't change, uh, is the perception of the work of the ch that change. So it's not uh, my point of view about the work that, uh, uh, or I change some way to do the work is the perception of the reality that surround the work today that uh, have a, a give a, a meaning to the work that perhaps I, ca I had not uh, think it in the past. So it's. Uh, but don't you think that your work changed at all? Yes, something meaning. Uh, you do a work, and after the work, uh, will keep the meaning of, of the people that look the work. It's like when you read a poetry. You give him, uh, in the poem, you can read your, your experience inside of the word that is uh, wrote from some other else. So the work, uh, the artwork, uh, it's okay and it's good when it have this uh, quality to can give uh, an answer or to can give imagination to the people that see the work. But you also made it possible. I must say that if it would not be for your insistence on certain materials and the way that you understand sculpture, um, certain conditions that we are experiencing and certain enthusiasm, even in younger generations, would not be possible. I, I do remember uh, the first, you know, experiencing your work in one way and also I remember the words of Caroline Christoph Bakargif saying that the Documenta 13 would be the Documenta of the animals and the trees, and the journalist wrote, this is the first Documenta that's going to be done for the dogs. So um, it was, you know, it, it, is, it is art that creates the conditions of a transformation, and you did that. So, you know, if it wouldn't be for a continuous insistence, in a certain way of trusting, because it's trust that made you go for it. You trust the material, you trust the tree, you trust the wood, you believe that they convey something, that it carries a system. So the whole system, not only because of your work, but thanks to your work a lot, it has been changed. But, uh, this is the, <laughs> is the, uh, the is again the reality that surrounded us that uh, perhaps produced by the activity of the man, but it, that he changed the, 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 the nature, he changed the, the elements that uh, surrounded him. But uh, uh, men have done that to, to survive and to make uh, the possibility of, uh, of surviving, of, of, of the number of people that is today in the world. So uh, it's very difficult to, to tell that this is a big mistake, uh, this, because uh, uh, the way to su support, the, pos uh, the to make the possibility to, to, to the people today existing uh, to, uh, to live, to, to eat, uh, he, he, sure, it destroyed something, energy, uh, the other energy. The problem is to, to, to found a kind of balance between the, the, this reality, because uh, we, uh, we have not to forget that men are nature too, and for nature in general, if man ex is existing or is not existing, nothing changes. It will be existing in other 
kind of life or, uh, or uh, uh, also a stone is a, a, have a life in a way. So it uh, is not a problem this for the nature. The problem is our, uh, if we want to survive, we have to be careful and to protect the nature. And this is uh, something that uh, everybody today understand. And how important is the dimension of listening when you hear us talking about listening? How important it is in your work? Uh, listening is uh, listen uh, is uh, is very important, uh, but, but uh, as uh, I, I I come back to my my <laughs> origin uh, in terms of work, uh, it, it, when you touch something, you listen to the material that you touch, you because you feel that the the the, the the, the kind of the material, you have a relation with the material. And this is a way to understand something that is not perhaps uh, tell, but uh, is existing in, uh, uh, under your hand. And just to wrap it up, but what, what is fascinating you at the moment, or what is something that you would like to do, or you are thinking, or you are you know, curious about that you have not done yet in your work? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, is, uh, uh, each day I do something very, very simple, very perhaps just a, a, piece, uh, a line with a pencil. And this is, uh, is also, uh, it can be fantastic too if it's uh, uh, something that is a, can give you a. Uh, a, an understood of the of the reality of the material and something that surrounded you, so it's not. Uh, I have no a project, global project. I have just a very normal process of uh, of life. I think we couldn't end with better words, and uh, I admire your humbleness because it's not humbleness. It's actually an attitude that we should all assume, which is you know to concentrate and admire the small gestures and possibilities that surround. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite contemporary artist Inji Evinar to the stage. Moving beyond my identity as an artist, and wearing the hat of a noun. I want to listen to my own works as someone else or nobody. And through this listening to unveil visual representation. This exciting process becomes a tool to experience the act of truly listening to my video works as things that are thrown into the world independently from me. Thus, to liberate my work from the many systems of meaning and their weight that I, the artist, loaded to them, intently or not, and provide it with an opportunity to talk itself is only possible by transformative power of listening to them. In a way, personifying a kind of other, I want to undress my own work. I want to allow the work to exist in nature and life by itself as an independent being, erasing my face as of an artist and thus refraining from the ego, opening a new horizon for me. Identity was enforced. Identity was multiplied. Identity was passed on. Identity was effaced. Central identities hit a wall. 
Central identities hit a wall. Third person, singular, let's call it Ubi for now, although there is not enough evidence to prove Ubi's existence as a person. Let's give it a name until proven otherwise. Ubi. I run into nursing modern fall in the morning of today after, the 19th of October 2021, before the clouds have had time to build a wall in front of things. I found it at the top of the tree, waiting. While I was on my way from the studio to home or walking backwards from home to my studio, I have been taking these walks probably since 2010 as one of my meaningless daily acts. The act of walking backwards the way that the path moves away from me at each step really calms me down and thus postpones the frustration that comes with the obligation of walking to the arriving at somewhere Anyway, uh, coming back to the story, the video work titled Nursing Modern Fall, produced by artist Inge Evinar, 2012, insists on meeting up. This insistence that came after this year, all this year, made me very anxious. I must listen to what it has to say, and I already feel the trauma that this act will cause. The act of listening, Ubu, to overhear the discomfort of this one-way communication in which the speaker does not recognize us as a subject and hence does not directly address to us, but we forcefully try to take part as a raw and formless being, push us to meddle and pair in vain. What we hear with images thinking doing this would give more meaning to our lives. So what we have to do here is to go the other way around and listen to what the images are whispering to us. But while doing this can, I, Ubi, become not a subject, but an empty body, searching for its sound or voice, could listening find itself a new space of being without getting interrupted by seeing? All of these are to make listening active and liberated from all the prejudice. Let us start. Action number one. We have to start somewhere, but I have just denied the visual guidance of the image. So where should I start? How am I going to find my way in this uncanny planet? This work is going to find my way in this uncanny planet, which no sound corresponds to its source. Listening to nursing modern fall, I realize that the sound wants neither to be a complement of a visual world, nor the sound of the object. To start listening for the act of listening first, to freely realize itself. We have to save it from where it is stuck in between language and body. Language and body. Action number two. When I close my eyes and open them, the thing in front of me starts to move. And I, lacking all sense of direction, roll over towards the sea. I am, topi, I am happy to be hypnotized by the tick tacks tick tacks and murmurs of these functioning things. To be drifting and to voluntarily give up my free will. The things that I am hearing here turning me into a creature that is swimming in the water, flying in the skies, and still carefully avoid naming what I am hearing, proposing them objects to hold on to and put myself through a considerable test. The condition of being a subject, 
Action number three. It is not possible to predict what is to come once a piece is missing. This missing piece has always fiercely gotten under my skin. What would have happened if I start this adventure with phantomology by my side? Crising this train of thought as a bold and formless creature who is comfortable in its, in its own skin, open to adventure as if everything it wants will happen. I had to listen to the insistent cries of artists within me told Every time, within me talk, at, at the, every last word is known to be hers. I do not want to be unfair to her and thus open up space for action 3A under action 3. The artist in Javinar. I am actually quite interested in how the modernist constructs of identity ideologies are reflected in architecture. The way that architecture has affected social and gender roles and identities is also equally interesting. I have spent my whole life drifting between the progressive ideals of modernism and traditions. I started nursing modern fall imitating the sketches of certain architects who are important for European cultural identity. But after some time, I abandoned this rational flow and continued to work in whatever way I, I wanted. The resulting architectural plans were freakle, stuttering, and funny, funny. While by drawing them, as a, as a woman tried to understand how the architectural plans shape my intellect. I also learned how to deal with them. One of the most important scenes, with great jealousy, I tried to imitate Auguste Pere plan for Champs-Élysées Theatre, which indeed stands at the very center of this video, but in the middle of my drawing process, I changed my mind and left the rain to the diamond coming in front door ajar. Thus, Perez's concrete structure turns into a stage for my madness. For a moment, let's put this statement by the artist on hold and continue to listen to the work. Following, following the months, I reach a sick man at the center of the parrot stage with his back facing us, having his knee curved into a ball and lying on the table. He looks resented and given up. Before taking his place at Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson as a cadaver amidst the murmurs, he hopes to take refuge in the infinity care of the nurses and the woman Four beautiful nurses, two of them sneering. One shakes the hand of patient, maybe out of affection or excessive hatred, to an extent that she decapitated him. And the head is quickly reborn from seas as, the, as a mythological, mythological strong athlete and lays back again on the table and awaits the four beautiful women. The cruelest of nurses look sarcastically into our eyes. The only way to avoid this glance is to listen to her. I do not comply with the role given to me. My desperation fell into me as a heavy melancholy during this play. The bitter venom of my sadness spilled into the sea. I am sly and clever, rebellious and sexy. I throw all things that you have associated with my rights back at you. My place is on the stage. Hop, 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 la, 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 hop, hop, hop. I came to Philharmonic Place to dance with Apollinaire and Picabia for my love to Pere. Ho, 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 la, la, la. 
At this moment, I hear a moan of pleasure. A woman pleased with her masculinity, loving herself amid sparkles. The rustling of her dress creates a tidal melody with the moan the old songs will not console you. The girl boy will lie down, watching herself to become a boy girl. Hey, 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 become a boy girl. Hey, 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 lo, lo, lo. Action listening number three. This time I am listening to the sound coming from the ceiling. What is the animal that spins around itself in circular motions and spins and spins? Lighting up the world as it spins, the sound from the ceiling is like a shout of victory out taking the weak voice of teenage girl. The covered gender of humanity, the sparkling source of the hypocrisy of pleasures, start with the innocence of socks at the tip of the foot, and tip of the foot, and tip of the foot, and, and. The desires from the feet to the top of the head rush, rush, to drown in the stars of a disco ball, to drown in the stars of the disco ball. Action listening for the underground. I put my ear to the floor. Footsteps again, the sound of a fierce struggle. The woman stands up to the womanhood. Woman to the mother, woman to the boss, woman to herself. Foot hook, leg hook, violence class pet. Flows from the earth to the bunkers underground. The underground sound of a snake brushing the soil to avoid meeting its own venom. Purr, 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 purr. The snake changes its skin and puts on glittering dressing gown. Bunkers, the leaking sewage and water leaks potential waterfalls. The disaster floats, waiting for their turn. Lies, the sign of the girl who got suspended on earth at the very last moment. Ah, ah, ah. Far below, a rabbit woman in one person cabin, no one knows when they become each other. Another one person shelter against things that she's counting the stars of an underground sky. Another shelter, a disabled person, moving her head constantly from the left to right, then right to left, and repeats. The scene splits into two ones. The only monosyllabic word she knows is heard. No, no. No. The retired and enthusiastic rabbit girl leading a group of proud workers. Action listening number five. Using Pere stage as a trampoline, I jump into the void, trying to hold the image for my life. The artist within me again applies pressure to my ears to take the floor. Much, 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 blub, blub. The artist. In nursing modern fall, I wanted to create a parallax order to create awkward spaces in which different points of view can transform the object that is look at and the scenes that continues to repeat are tried to be taken under control or healed by mad women, nurses, sportsmen, lovers treasure hunters, national athletes, doctors, and architects. Could of them cure the demise of modern, the, the belief of progress? Came here loudly alongside freedom and then turned shamefully into a whisper. You hold the ability to construct life? It's a lie. 
the Palladio staircase help us to connect to a different elements of architecture. The architectural pieces echo in space, the sound of rusty iron tanker rest ashore. The sound travels from Kalamush to Gimishuyu. Venice to Istanbul, twice. Again, three minutes later, the sound travels twice. Once full and once empty. Full, empty. Full, empty. Action listening number six. A concert of, concert of aircraft engine factory, 1940. A group of young patriots suddenly starts to chant an atom and the Pratt and Whitney aircraft engine factory. One of them carries a silver flag, another enlightened society with a disco balls. A hardworking and popular virtuous patriot leads his crowd. The whole crowd is singing together a barely audible anthem. Bir hızla kötülüğü geriliği boğarız. Karanlığın üstünde güneş gibi doğarız. We break the evil backwardness in hassle. We rise like the sun over the darkness. I suddenly rise to find my place on fancy pangolin skin seat of the aircraft. Yes, I cannot believe what I am hearing from where I stand. You, me, and the earth. You, me, and the pangolin seeds. You, me, and the ants. One by one, one by one, I count the planes and my pockets are full of ants. Stop, stop, stop. Action listening of labor. I want to fail into the space between the ordinary disorder of the disappointed order of things and excessiveness of the destruction and madness. The girls have their back to the sun. Are they trying to erase the lines on the map or is this a scavenger hunt? The promises of the map are discovery, power, happiness, welfare and richness. The sound of labor, tick, tock, tick, tick, tick. Where will the girls carry the G-string beneath their workman suits like a flag? Where we will the tick tocks of labor expose, expose the enemy? When those the tick tocks of labor kill a young girl, a young girl, a action bodily sound number eight. When I am alone, I can trace the moment of sound in space. Like an arrow with a sharp end, sometimes it goes through the body without piercing it. The moment of the lips of the girl who is reading a book here, in the middle of silence, reminded me of words kissed on lips, smile, heart, ringing, greeting, loving, Smelling. When I pay attention to the sound, I hear the, the kan kan dancing. Boarding school leakage girl gets her food stuck in the garbage can. Upstairs from the old concrete columns of nursing modern fall, a garbage can, a bad memories can. To give your food to something or someone in a dream will make your enemies happy. The dream reader, you are wearing snake skin pajamas with your foot in the silver bucket. You are waiting for your wedding night for your survival. Action bodiless networks of sound. Number nine, maps. The sound of the foot walking on soil turns into the loose deposits. A satellite map the interest of knowing the world, the networks are talking over the world, taking over the world, and the cosmic sound of the invisible rhizome that connect with them very thin threads. Now, 
here in Venice, Italy, let's listen to the sound coming from the ground under and the sky. One of the girls I know, she usually lives on those streets, believes that she can ride scale on like a horse. This is just funny, it's so funny. The years in 1951, Festival of Britain, Skylone by Powell and Moya and Royal Festival Hall. The sound is at the intersection of language and body, but it is neither a part of the language nor the body. Let us not forget the girl in her underwear rising the disco ball in her hand to the sky, who tries to remind this maddening crowd of their citizenship duties. If I had to identify with someone in this video, I would choose her, stuck between womanhood and citizenship. With the knee-high socks, I ask from where a gun band stands, how do we listen to a body that is not a citizen? Departing from the language, I plunge into murmurs with heartfelt love. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome back on Zoom Hashim Sarkis with the professor in the history, theory, and criticism section at the Department of Architecture from MIT, Caroline Jones. Thank you very much. These have been amazing acts uh, to follow for us. Uh, and I do want to highlight the importance of the lyrical spaces that were opened up just now in the two presentations that uh, preceded. And also, if I may extract something from the Pinone piece uh, in relationship to the theme of the Binali, but also to its arrangement as a space. Uh, Giuseppe, we've had a big challenge throughout, not just myself, but previous curators uh, in dealing with uh, Sansovino's amazing, but very overwhelming Gachandri structure. And every time anyone tried to step into that space, uh, Sansovino elegantly from a distance defeated them. Uh, what is beautiful about your piece is that it maintained a very modest dialogue with uh, the Gajandri, but a, a elegant distance uh, by staying outside and by acknowledging its own size in relationship to that humongous structure, uh, maintaining what one can call a dialogue of unequals through the modesty that you've introduced and as a result conquered the space with your modesty. So thank you very much for that elegant uh, introduction of the Vuzla Foundation into the world of art and architecture, but also in uh, for your help in solving uh, what has been a perpetual problem for curators, which is the Gajandre problem. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to introduce uh, Caroline Jones to this uh, discussion. Caroline needs no introduction. She has been very present in the thinking about art and its role in uh, society uh, throughout her writing, particularly in her work on uh, acoustic art, uh, brings in a very interesting dimension and the history to this endeavor that we're embarking on with the Buslat Foundation. And uh, Caroline has also partaken in the curation of the Future Assembly uh, project in the Biennale, in the Giardini, uh, which is uh, an attempt on the part of six co-curators to uh, think of what would it take to expand the General Assembly of the United Nations after the 75th anniversary, and uh, to introduce uh, non-human members in the future assembly. Uh, I will let Caroline speak to this, but there's also another dimension where Caroline is uh, very much invested and involved in the project of generous listening, which is in her leadership of the Transmedia Storytelling Initiative at MIT and the collaboration there with the Vuslat Foundation. So on 
for all of the above and for all of these different possibilities and potentials that Caroline's work opens up, uh, please join me in welcoming Caroline uh, to the virtual stage here. Can everyone hear me? Don't care so much if you see me, but hoping you can hear me. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a great privilege and an honor to be part of this conversation with curators and artists whom I so deeply admire. I'm going to attempt to share my screen and I want to optimize for video and for sound. And hopefully I have the bandwidth to do this. Can everyone see and not not yet here, but at least see my screen? You'll tell me if you can't. So I wanted to focus um, with great interest in my own heart on the potential for generous listening within the complex and often digital and often virtual forms uh, that artists are using today. And MIT is, of course, actively teaching this material. And I want in particular to just touch on uh, a few signal examples of what we might expect uh, to emerge now that we are implementing the V Foundation's Generous Listening Fellowship for our amazing graduate students. So these are just thumbnails of materials that I'm going to be speaking about incredibly briefly today. And, you know, at the last minute, of course, listening to Chus and Pannone, I had to add uh, a couple of uh, slides because I'm an art historian. And I'm, I'm very moved by the fact that our own brain processes hearing in a similar mechanosensory way as it processes touch. In other words, we don't, I mean, you might think you hear sound directly, but in fact, you're hearing a touch of vibrating airwaves, vibrating material on a very physical tympanum, right, in your eardrum. So I was very moved by Pannone's discussion of the relationship to the potato, right, which does become these extraordinarily beautiful cast objects, because the depositing of, a, of, a, of an iron version of a hand around a potato is a way of listening to the potato growing. It's a way of extending human touch into the more than human time frame of the vegetal, which is so different from our forms of attention. So with that inspiration, I'm going to simply proceed on this discussion of our MIT initiative in transmedia storytelling which involves a lot of different groups, which I'm not going to explain here, but merely to show you uh, this, this constellation, which I think of as an ecosystem, an ecosystem of different kinds of species of pedagogical and learning entities, and their very different affordances within this system. Now, of course, we're thrilled to be working with the Vuslop Foundation on this new uh, a fellowship for generous listening. And this is just very new. We've just released the proposal to students and the applications are pouring in. We have encouraged them to think about these areas of generous listening. Spaces of listening, which of course as a school of architecture and planning, we're extremely engaged with. Novel ways of listening. So the technology that is part of MIT's uh, name, the MIT you know, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the transformation of reception through listening, and, and I'll touch on that. That's where the heart enters the ear. Listening to the more than human or the non-human, and of course, part of Vuslat's heart is listening to each other. So how are these likely to roll out in these proposals that are just now coming in from our amazing graduate students? Uh, a guide can be suggested by my collaborator, Dr. Shadi Zaman. It feels like the Turks are taking over these generative frames. Um, Shadi, in his teaching with Fox Harrell on virtuality and presence, already encodes listening as the first exercise. Students are challenged to create a sound portrait of themselves listening. What are the sounds in their world that make them as subjects. 
So this spatialized listening is already a part of our ecosystem. And now we're going to move into the challenge for the students to begin thinking about the spaces of listening because sound waves are always encoded by the spaces that they reverberate within, the, the resonance that provides us with information about how we navigate this world. So what are the roles of digital and physical spaces in listening? What are the opportunities presented by transmedia for crafting spaces of generous and generative listening? We can imagine some of the responses will be like the videos that were produced in the first generation of transmedia storytelling um, narratives. And I'm just, I'm gonna try and play a little bit of this video. I'm going to speed ahead to a moment around 4.08, where we have um, the students who made this virtual reality encounter with the spaces of protest in the Black Lives Matter marches in Manhattan. So you have to imagine it's a pandemic and students are stuck in their rooms, they can't go anywhere, and they're actually bringing these free expressions of anguish and community engagement right, into an augmented reality of their own space, right? So they're encountering these journalistic um, video clips and narratives from their own living room. And I'm hoping that if I can move to this one, we can get to listen to it. It's a black nurse who's speaking about her efforts to save her pandemic into another one. Um, we fought COVID and that was the worst three months I've ever experienced in healthcare. And then to come into something like this and witness what you witness on the television that we all saw happen to George Floyd. When I go to work every day, I don't discriminate. I have combative patients, we have psych patients, we have mental illnesses, and we restrain people without having to hurt them or kill them. So for me, this was a very, very powerful artwork that a team of students had produced across three of our different departments. It was powerful because the stated position of our mainstream newspaper journalism was the protests on the street are destructive, they're vandals, they're destroying things. But when you encountered these vernacular video and sound files, you realized that people were putting their lives at risk during a pandemic to go and be together and there was joy in that. There was exultation in that. There was purpose in that. And it was a corrective to mainstream journalism that I found extremely powerful. There's more, because listening within space, embodying a narrative, is a way of triggering human memory. Shadi Zaman in his PhD project has studied the effect of spatialized encounter with media versus a flat screen version of it. And he's done the psychological studies to prove that, vi that visitors to these virtual spaces remember what they encounter much more within this spatial encoding of sound and memory. We can also imagine novel ways of listening because our students are already coming up uh, during the pandemic with ways of measuring spaces acoustically to thereby listen to urban activity and its lack thereof, okay? So these are two contrasts between June and July when the pandemic had basically shut down public spaces versus when they became open again, entirely measured by a spatialized sonic database. So this is the, this is the kind of thing our students are interested in doing and what the Vuslat Foundation Fellowship should be able to do is encouraging them to make narratives of meaning, of cultural connection, and of transformation out of such data gathering activities. Listening to each other. This is of course crucial. And I happen to know that one of the proposals coming is from a very interesting architecture student who worked with me in a landscape seminar and was moved to go through the American park system and provide the voices of Native American peoples who had been eradicated from these ancestral lands in order to make spaces of visual contemplation, right? This is a profound example of how the auditory can provide voices that have been silenced by the construction of a landscape sublime. I'm very excited about these proposals and I'm looking forward to amazing work as a result. 
transformation through listening. We're heading in a direction with our Department of Urban Studies where we can welcome the MIT graduate, Debbie Lockwood, who's going to be speaking about her book, 1001 Voices on Climate Change, resulting from her bicycle trip across the country to speak with people about their narratives of how the climate crisis is touching their lives. So Debbie prompts us for this, this amazing session coming up in a couple of weeks. What is deep listening and how is it relevant to the climate movement? What languages can we use to draw people into stories of climate change rather than push them away? Her actual polemic is around the inadequacy of data and data visualization to help us get to the heart of our human behaviors in relation to the planet that is our home and our only place to be. Listening to the more than human is thus a very important part of my own interest in having this fellowship really make a difference. And I'm looking to uh, students whose dissertations I'm part of, such as the amazing Media Lab PhD student, Nicole Lerillier, who is listening to cosmic indigenous and natural sonorities, including our own local marshlands for which she has produced sort of marsh symphonies so that we can imagine the incredible work of oxygenation that goes into these territories that were formerly thought of as wastelands to be filled in and create land for urban occupation. So thank you, Buslot Foundation. We are incredibly excited to begin this work and inspired by your leadership and generous listening. Caroline, thank you very much. Uh, I want a cue, uh, given that I'm so far away, like you, I want a cue from the organizers as to how much time we've left to have a discussion. Uh, can someone send me in the chat or on my phone? Three minutes. Three minutes okay. Caroline, you raised a lot of very interesting examples and uh, many of them highlighted actually one challenge that we haven't discussed yet in the space of listening that we're trying to create. First of all, I think what, what you brought to the table also, not just in terms of the wealth of examples, but in terms of the understanding of what it takes is the complexity of a network that is necessary to build in order for this exercise to be meaningful. And uh, what I admired about the Vuslat Foundation from the get-go is its uh, ability to, since its inception, uh, build a network, to imagine itself not as being in an isolated space, but about feeding and supporting and connecting to the network from the Biennale to MIT to Tufts to Istanbul and other locations. It's, it's one of the few foundations that don't have one home base at, its ince at their inception, but many. But that opens another challenge, which you highlighted yourself, which is that when we listen, we listen to people speaking in different tongues uh, with different areas of expertise. And you highlighted in your talk uh, how this transmedia storytelling is about different media speaking to each other and across. And uh, also that we are not just different individuals and species, but we speak with different tongues. And so can you speak a little bit to the space, but also the challenge of translation that is involved in this process of uh, transdisciplinary listening? I love the question. And of course, some entities speak without tongues at all, right? <laughs> so this is part of our, our delightful challenge. I will again allude to one of our remarkable students. So a Media Lab dissertation, uh, sorry, a master's uh, work that I was privileged to be part of is with my colleague Ekene Ijeoma in the Poetic Justice Lab at MIT's Media Lab. And Ekene has a beautiful project listening to the voices in many languages, counting numbers as part of the US Census Project, which famously undercounts the voices of non-English speaking immigrants. And my student, Nina Lutz, challenged herself to provide a sign language equivalent of this auditory counting, right? Sign language is a profound space of translation for 
the differently able human, right? Which cannot hear the counting of the other languages, but speaks a profoundly visual language of hands and bodies in motion. So this, I just, I kind of want to throw it back to the inspiration of Pannone's work, uh, which is very, very important to me personally, because I was at MoMA when he did his amazing drawing of touch curving out of the wall. Maybe you remember that, Giuseppe? Anyway, it certainly changed my life. So this idea of the haptic, the touch, as a place of relation, is now translated through a video of hands speaking that will then be translated further into understanding of what number that is. In other words, we can use AI, we can use machine learning as a place of compassionate translation. And this is how I want to tweak the technology in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> I always want it to come to the place of the human rather than taking us to the place of the cyborg or the robot or the machine. Thank you very, very much, Caroline. I think we're, our three minutes are out, but uh, this was an amazing three minutes response. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to welcome back Chus Martinez and director of the Generous Listening and Dialogue Center at Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life, Kenan McKenzie, and architect Francesco Bergamo. Consecutive. So we have heard so, so many good thinking about um, listening, and we don't have much time, but still time enough for a short conversation with two really um, experts in the subject matter. Um, during the Zoom uh, time, as I call it, um, the Zoom era, um, I was kind of um, totally suffocated by the fact that I was surrounded by uh, grow-up people uh, complaining, mostly. So I um, kind of managed to make an open call and um, create a small children council for um, creating an exhibition that was virtually made in Iceland. And in one of these encounters that took place on Friday's afternoon with uh, my curator colleagues, that they were in between uh, 10 and 12, uh, we watch a video by, by a marine biologist talking about how uh, the language of whales happen. And then um, th he was explaining in that video that actually um, the scientists discovered that, um, that the whales also listen to each other because when the baby whales are talking, then um, they, they talk baby whale, and then um, the mothers, which are not next to them, that are a little bit uh, apart, sometimes repeat baby whale and do another sound that is not baby whale. So the baby whales understand that they are being corrected and they repeat what the mother said, but they, they switch again to baby whale. So we were really surprised and we're like, does he mesmerize? And then one of the child said, are you all very surprised? And then we were all very surprised. It's like, wow, baby whale and, and, and they, you know, they have been listened and corrected. So somebody listened to, to them, the mothers as mothers do and correct. And then one of the child said like, yeah, this is really not surprising, but I am very surprised about the fact that baby whales, when they are born, do they take, they don't talk perfect baby whale. They just talk wrong whale language. And then they learn how to, and it's through the process of listening to each other that, and it, in the room, Zoom room, we were all kind of agreeing that the big surprise is that we humans uh, couldn't actually realize that there is a process of learning 
that is going on in all species, even in ourselves, but we have been not exposed enough to the process of learning, to what it demands, what it is, to the beauty of it, to the, to the moment of repeating, doing, and being a baby whale till you become a whale and hopefully perhaps you don't even grow up and then you just listen to the, to the child inside you. So um, I thought it would be a fantastic question to Keenan actually to ask what does it demand to introduce uh, those processes in the very process of learning, the process of listening, and how can we actually invent new spaces that are not based in providing the right answer only or at all? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really uh, grateful because I feel like this is such a courageous space. I'm really grateful to the foundation for making this space. I was really enjoying your story. Um, as you could probably tell, I have young children myself. but. I was actually sharing a story with a colleague this morning here about spaces where we just listen to children. And one of the opportunities I've had to see that is in something we call the documentation studio that we had at Wheelock College for about a decade. And the activity actually originated in Italy here, ironically, where the idea was to have children play or resolve something among themselves and just watch and listen. And then it's documented by video so that you're not interacting with them. And then later, the teachers learn from the students how they think about solving things as simple as how to share something, how to create a solution for a toy or an a issue that doesn't work. But for some reason, we begin to move away from that after we leave early childhood. We actually make less space for children to have unstructured time. So playing starts to seem unnecessary. Recess, free time, social time starts to seem less important. But what we're asking ourselves now, particularly as we're looking at issues of mental health crises, are where do we make spaces for student voices, for student input, and for unstructured time for children to actually interact with each other and in a way that is more equitable, that isn't about the adults in the space structuring all of the conversation and all of the interactions. How do students give voice to what it is they need? And how do we reintroduce that after the time where we think it's cute because it's play, but when it's actually about a feedback loop that starts? where we do work with them, they share, we co-create what their learning experience is like because we actually value their voices in an equitable way. So I think part of the role of this center is trying to be able to center this idea that we don't stop paying attention when play is no longer the mode of communication. Sometimes we don't hear the things we're expecting or want to hear, but as we start to center the feedback, and we listen more to young people, and we listen to our future leaders, I think we will really make more progress in actually understanding that unstructured spaces and just listening actually will help us to really understand what is necessary. And we've heard that all throughout the morning about knowing what's necessary for the ocean, for us to survive, for us to live. But young people and our future leaders have a lot that we need to hear um, but creating equitable spaces for them to do that, I think, is going to be really critical. I think it's uh, great what you are just saying, because so many times we hear us talking about things that do not work, complaining about the systems and the structural problems that we just pass on. So when we talk about education, we are normally talking about the transmission and the teaching. So we still talk about the fact that we are, even if we don't like the world as it is, we don't seem to have any problem to just transfer it again and again and again to others. So as you are saying, it's super difficult to see a space of transformation if transmission is top down and if transmission is just uh, perceived as, um, as a transfer that does not happen from the children to us. And what are the challenges? What, why is that not happening so much? What do you think are the barriers that we need to you know, dissolve in order for this uh, taking place? 
Well, I would say one of the challenges um, is something that I see when I'm working with adults, when we're doing professional development, for example. Uh, one of my colleagues made a point the other day by saying, we sometimes reach a point in our lives where we've decided we're done changing. We have decided that we have decided what is gonna work for us and our families, and anyone who comes to challenge that, including our young people, is unwelcome. And maybe we don't consciously do it, but there's a point at which we just like, this is just who I'm gonna be. This is who I am. And we make a line of demarcation between that and future ideas. And so certainly if you think there is an inequity in terms of authority and power between you and young people, the idea is that you can protect that boundary. You can decide that there's nothing else for you to learn from them, right? But just as you were sharing in that really beautiful narrative around what we learned about another species and the reaction from the young people, everybody was in awe because part of what you're doing is actually engaging in something new. And sometimes I'll ask in my conversations, when was the last time you changed your mind? And sometimes people are stumped. They can't remember the last time they changed their minds about something that was really important to them because they have decided their minds are fixed about certain things. So young people are often asking us to engage them in a way that might change our minds. And for some people, that is uncomfortable. But we can also have those moments of inspiration and awe uh, when we do allow them to really share with us. And so that is something that I think we all are working on, but it is a continued challenge when you're looking at a space where people may feel like their boundaries about who they are and who they've decided to be is fixed and somehow being challenged by hearing something new or hearing a different perspective. Yeah, and um, the other day I was having a conversation among my own staff, which are art teachers, and I was saying that for me, or in my um, opinion, the street revolution um, gave birth to the body revolution. So, uh, you know, in 68, and not only, um, the taking of the space, of the public space, of protesting, of taking your body to that space and protesting, has been giving birth to something um, even better than that, which is seeing your own body as something that can be transformed, can become a hybrid, can be fluid, and the revolution takes place in the sense that in a non-binary world, you could be unstable in an identity, under an identity point of view, that you can change not only once, perhaps now we are seeing transitions that we just uh, uh, understand from one point to the next, but those fluidities in identity may come again and again and be uh, recurrent in super productive ways because at the end of the day, uh, the question of uh, the fluidity in gender, for example, corresponds to the desire of morphing, of becoming, as you say, of learning. So if you learn through life, you may not be the same gender, the same identity when you are born as the identity that you acquire uh, later on. So the right to transform and being socially perceived in that transformation is actually a space of pedagogy, a, a space of seeing a positive uh, transformation in the eyes of others. And um, you, Francesco, you have been, um, and you are a researcher in sound ecology and fluidity and the unmaterial is a super important part of it. So the interaction in between things we see and things we don't see, but perceive and transform and alter um, our mind and consciousness. So what do you think are spaces still that, you know, how do you see that, that we can transform um, public and also private spaces towards this more, yeah, encompassing uh, experiences that we are all kind of wishing for? Thank you for your question and for the invitation as well. Um, I would like to start uh, a little bit from afar I changed my mind many things about uh, what uh, uh, I could uh, uh, say today to contribute to this uh, debate and to this presentation. And um, I changed my mind many times <laughs> during this event because I've been listening and listening. I, <laughs> I changed my mind. This is something that often happens to me. Uh, I don't know if it's a fortune or not. In most of the cases, it's not really a fortune, I have to say. But um, uh, I was uh, 
thinking when you just was uh, talking mm, with Giuseppe Penone about uh, um, one thing uh, that regards the, the sculpture and that is also uh, an important uh, still uh, fundamental exercise of problem in uh, philosophy and in perception um, which is uh, uh, it, it has to do with the uh, definition of sound but uh, uh, it also implies uh, listening uh, because there is this th the question is um, if uh, in a forest a, a tree falls but there is no one listening uh, does it make a sound so there are very different um, answers <laughs> to this question according to um, disciplinary fields to philosophers um, we can find uh, uh, different uh, uh, answers uh, uh, also in recent books about uh, sound and about listening mm, two recent books are uh, François Bonnet, The Order of Sound and an Italian book by Elvira Di Bona and Vincenzo Sant'Arcangelo which is on sound um, with a very philosophical take um, so um, I leave aside the, the, the problem of uh, thinking about what a sound is, but uh, uh, the act of listening uh, is anyway what makes things present to us. But I think that uh, after uh, visiting this sculpture and listening to you, uh, there are also other questions that arise. So, um, uh, are there sounds, but uh, is there the possibility of listening also if the tree doesn't fall? Or when it has fallen? <laughs> and is the tree capable of listening? Uh, in this case, of course, we, I think we agree that uh, a tree is capable of listening and we can think about listening in many, many different ways, of course. But uh, uh, I think that this uh, metaphysical problems really uh, resonates with, um, uh, with many of the things that have been said uh, this, uh, this afternoon. And about uh, uh, your, uh, your question, um, I think this is part of the answer. So um, being... Uh, open to listening, but also uh, being aware that uh, everyone and everything around us is listening. So being aware of the, of the context and of, uh, of, of what Gestalt psychology calls the background, <laughs> because the tree that falls is the figure, but there is also the background which uh, causes maybe the, the tree falling. Um, I experienced a little bit, um, if I'm going too long, please stop me. <laughs> okay. uh, I've experienced a little bit the, 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 the question that you are um, uh, given to me, because as a student of architecture, I realized that uh, um, almost no one of my teachers uh, told me about uh, how to take care of how the spaces could sound and could uh, uh, mm, provide uh, a designerly approach to uh, interaction with the space, with the materials, and also with the other people inhabiting the space, unless it is a concert hall, maybe. Um, well, um, I started to investigate by, by myself somehow, and I discovered that there were not many books about this, but today there are a lot of books about this. There are many colleagues who are working in this field, in some cases uh, struggling <laughs> also to find uh, their own position um, because somehow this kind of uh, studies uh, is uh, 
consider, let's say, borderline, at least in Italy. Mm, the same goes for, I think, some of my uh, colleagues with whom we are trying to, to build a research unit at uh, UAV, the university where I'm, where I'm currently teaching, teaching as an assistant professor. Um, so some of us are still struggling to find our own position from different disciplinary point of view. But I think that research and education also in the university uh, is one uh, important uh, um, place and one important uh, uh, take on, uh, on your question. So uh, we see that uh, students' uh, interest is growing towards sounds. Uh, I see it even if I teach drawing, so my students at the first year draw by hand, so they just <laughs> start observing things. I think that uh, uh, observing uh, also can be maybe considered as a synonymous of listening in the, in the way we are considering it right now. Mm, and uh, we, I think one important thing is to try to make them aware of the relations between visual and oral culture, for example. Uh, we all know that we live in a mostly visual uh, world, not only, uh, obviously, but we, are, uh, we have more instruments, more tools to um, uh, understand uh, and criticize the visual artifacts around us than um, oral uh, artifact, so it's much easier to be um, deceived by, by sound. And uh, one of this is one thing. And the other important thing, I'm finding it in, uh, in the arts, uh, especially when mm, the arts meet um, communities uh, with a political, in the most noble <laughs> uh, exception, of course, way. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, um, artists and mm, very few curators like you who are um, considering uh, the practice practices of listening for uh, uh, for the people and for uh, for the community uh, in Italy. I they are not the only uh, two associations, but there are I think two two important associations that are doing uh, this kind of work. Uh, which are standards in Milan and uh, Mu in Cesena. Mm, they are uh, composed of uh, mostly musicians and artists, but uh, um, with very uh, small devices somehow. We could call them poor devices uh, if, we, if we want to force a relation to, uh, to, to the very important work by Giuseppe Penone, which is important also for these persons, of course. Uh, um, very poor, like a stone, uh, like a piece of uh, wood, uh, um, and trying to explore the possibilities uh, uh, of those materials, but also of, of common spaces. Uh, for example, by taking uh, workers who have been in a, working in a factory for uh, 10, 20, 30 years uh, to listen to through microphones and to interact by listening also with the environment which comprises persons also around them. But I, I have a question for both of you, and um, you know, Going back to the words of Buslat at the beginning in her introduction, um, everything has been designed, and both of you have a lot to do with design in the sense of education is a design for a transmission, architecture and space is the design for a position, for a presence, and the perception of the importance of those uh, that are in that space. So everything is really designed for an idea of uh, having an answer and broadcasting it. The answer needs to be right, the broadcast will be successful. Leadership is based on the possibility of uniqueness. Exceptionality is everything that distinguishes and makes um, the idea of, uh, of the possibility of following, of having a vision, for example. So almost nothing in the narrative of the Western culture is defined for co-creation is defined in the space of actually um, relaxing because if you relax you are losing the time 
and there is no space in education for almost anything else than delivery contest. There is the contest for those that they know and those that also through social media and through their own work and so on need to deliver their own exceptionality so that the system fishes them out and distinguish in between those that they are going to make it from those that they are not going to make it. So if you are stum or if you don't deliver, then the system automatically um, erases you or slows you down in the process of being present in the social. And that's a fact. And that's a fact that, uh, that worries me a lot. And I think that is, th therefore, I perceive the idea of generous listening as a fundamental um, transformation into the very uh, restructuring of our metaphoric, symbolic, and factical ideas of what power is and if power is sustained by individuals or by communities. And I defend um, passionately the second option. But Kinan, Francesco, what should I do? I think how can I, for example, in education, in an art education context or in, the, in a cultural structure context, introduce uh, that dimension? What are the tools and what are the possibilities and the methods and even the interlocutors, which are not many, actually? Well, I know we're short on time. We'll have a long conversation about this, but what I do want to say is that as much as we bemoan the pandemic, it has given us a really unique and wonderful opportunity to rethink and redesign. And some of the things that are ailing us that we are talking about, particularly with young people around mental health, around socialization, I can't tell you how many people have said to me while I was here or at home that, children are returning to school, not really being sure how to interact with each other. These are all indicators that open up the dialogue around what we really need to be healthy. And I would argue that although we're part of a system, for the most part in Western society, that values production and all the things you mentioned and quantifying everything, that we are having a pushback of sorts, energetically, metaphysically, financially in many ways where people are saying, I cannot participate anymore. So it really isn't always about pushing back intentionally. We are a part of an ecosystem. We are a part of nature. And so if we go against our very nature, we suffer. And so oftentimes what we respond to in our human experience is suffering. And when we see the suffering of children, when we see the suffering of workers, we start to take notice and then we do listen more. And so there is a unique opportunity here to do more listening to not just what is being said, but we have a term I used to like, but I heard it here today. There's the voice of the voiceless. You also should pay attention to what you're not hearing and who you're not hearing from and why and think about that. These are all unique opportunities so that the what to do, like how do we introduce more health in terms of time, in terms of what we consider resources, and how do we stop only wanting to value what is quantifiable, part of that is we have been forced to go slower. We have been forced to notice that we have to value other things besides just production. And if we're noticing, we can see that some of those answers are happening organically. Um, so I think this is an opening to do that. I think this is an opening that's allowing us to do that. Um, and if you want to think about any silver linings, uh, which I think there are some in this pandemic, I think that is one of the gifts that we have, that we have been made to pay attention um, to some things that we wanted to um, you know, pave over by just being more productive. And, some things require that we rest and pay attention. And I think that if we are willing to do that, we will start to be a healthier overall ecosystem um, of humans and, and other um, entities that make up our space. And we'll want to be a part of that in a healthy way. Very yeah. true. Francesco? Mm, I think that uh, mm, there can be uh, interlocutors. Mm -hmm. um, it's. I think it's just difficult to find them uh, in some uh, institutional contexts. 
um, I'm, think, I'm thinking specifically about uh, uh, Italy, but, uh, but not only, of course. Um, I think that uh, one, uh, besides this, um, maybe they just need to emerge, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but one of the things that uh, some people are struggling to do in their own little way uh, is uh, um, building uh, spaces, I mean it metaphorically mostly, um, for uh, uh, listening to each other, getting in touch, communities uh, which live in the same neighborhood but don't meet, um, building also uh, spaces for the conflict which is often uh, left aside uh, um, almost anywhere possibly, uh, maybe even in, in the arts, most of the times uh, uh, when mm, uh, there are the art talks, uh, uh, everything seems beautiful, but uh, not always things are <laughs> really beautiful. It's not the case, of course, but I'm just uh, thinking about the quest your question because I think that you are uh, already doing much and what I, uh, I would stress out of, of your work, of I think our work, uh, uh, it's not always easy, it's not easy uh, for me at least, uh, is to uh, be uh, listening uh, continuously. It's very difficult, of course, but it means um, being uh, uh, open, being open to uh, always merge what we are doing uh, with uh, mm, the possible lives of the people we are dealing with, uh, constantly uh, negotiating our approach, uh, being, uh, you were uh, saying it before, being uh, open to change our approach, to change our mind uh, um, in respect of mm, the people we have uh, uh, around us. Um, it's uh, uh, something that uh, um, I'm using a term which, uh, if there are musicians, uh, may not uh, appreciate or some maybe may appreciate, which is uh, we are always improvising. Um, I'm thinking about uh, specifically a conference. Uh, um, I've read the written text by one of the most important percussionists, which is Seijiro Murayama, he this this uh, um, talk uh, at the Center Pompidou, if I'm not wrong, some years ago, which title was uh, Improvisation and Life. He's uh, an improviser. He does. He knows really well what he does. Uh, he's uh, perfect <laughs> in some in some ways, uh, exceptional. Mm, but he, what he does always. Um, responds to the place where he is and to the audience. So it can never be the same because it's always uh, negotiating uh, second by second uh, what is happening uh, when he is uh, playing or, or teaching with uh, the persons and the space around. So I think that this um, openness uh, is uh, uh, in uh, an attitude, an exercise, and I, I like this uh, uh, adjective generous because obviously this uh, attitude could have uh, uh, many, um, many aims. Uh, one could use it to, to become stronger, uh, to make the other uh, more, uh, more frail, but uh, we, um, I think that the idea of uh, uh, doing the best that we can to um, consider ourselves and also the other species uh, as a community is what uh, is what we can do. Just an attitude, but I think it can make a difference. Yeah, very wise words. Um, we are running out of time, but I was wondering if uh, Buslat and perhaps Giuseppe could come on stage, even if there is no much time for anything else, at least to appear together. Um, Thank you very much for all the speakers. I would like to invite uh, Buslat and Giuseppe Fenone and Inge Evinar on stage for some closing remarks. 
Um, I am the director of the Vuslat Foundation, and um, thank you for joining us at the Generous Listening Symposium today. We would like to hear your questions, but um, if you can please send them via uh, social media, via at Generous Listening from Instagram, it would be great, because we would really like to hear from you. If Vuslat and Giuseppe Penone and Inji can come on stage for closing remarks, that would be fantastic. Yes. Just, yes, to be on stage and to say goodbye. It's like a family picture. Don't skip that part. Because we don't talk, right? Otherwise, we would never. Uh, we do talk, but uh, it's only we don't have much time because we need to, unfortunately, close. But perhaps there is a sentence or or a thought just to to close this, and uh, you know. You are the initiator, so perhaps you have something to say that we can take home. Um, I really want to deeply thank each one of you. I mean, with Hashim inviting us on this uh, initiative and really encouraging and supporting us when it was just an idea out there and, uh, and making it, having us you know, speed up our, our way <laughs> into the real world, meeting with you choose, and Penono with his very much generosity, sharing with us his, his art and, and making it a symbol to bring it to life. In Giano, it was an amazing, um, amazing performance, uh, and also Kenan and uh, Francesco to be here. But most of it, most, most, most important of this, for you, being so patiently listening to us and being on this journey with your hearts, with your passion, with your enthusiasm. This is, a, I was always thinking this is a huge big rock and in order to move it, we need, um, we need either a magic like Penona's tree or a lot of effort. But yesterday a colleague of mine said, no, think of it as different. It is a ball up in the, on the mountain, a snowball, and with all the efforts that's being, that are compounding and combining together, we can roll it faster and bigger. And that image I really like, so I want to keep it in my, in my heart and mind and share it with you. Only with your have efforts we can roll this snowball bigger and faster. Thank you very much. Make an intention to generously listen today. Thank you. So thank you so much. So we close it here. <laughs> so. Yeah, Giuseppe, you want to say something? Uh, <laughs> no, um, I have to tell you something that perhaps you don't know. I am deaf. You are deaf. <laughs> deaf. I am deaf from, <laughs> from one. Uh, oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I am really. <laughs> I am really <laughs> I appreciate a lot to be <laughs> a keynote <laughs> in a list. <laughs> I, I really like Italian humor. Inchi? Uh, thank you for listening. And also, I am very happy to listen, all of you. I'm very proud of to be here and to be part of this uh, this listening. Uh, progressive ideas, uh, many very brilliant ideas. I'm very happy. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks Great. to all of you.